Hello and welcome to Creating a Human Rights Culture, which aims to promote a lived awareness of the interdependency and indivisibility of human rights principles in our minds, hearts, and bodies, that is, dragged into our everyday lives. What, after all, is freedom of speech to a person who is homeless and lives in a world at war? Therefore, it is dedicated ultimately to the application of the Human Rights Triptych, which in brief consists of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at its center, the conventions, that is, international treaties on the right, and implementation measures on the left. Hello, I'm Joseph Ronka, and welcome to another episode of Creating a Human Rights Culture which calls for a lived awareness of human rights principles in our minds and our hearts and dragged into our everyday lives. Today I have the pleasure to be with a colleague, a friend, Dr. Rhoda Smith. Good morning. Enchanté, Very nice as to they be say. With you. Yes. In French. Okay. And um, she's most graciously consented to be on the show. Um, I've known you for about how long now? Two semesters? Two That's semesters. Seven months, and yes. I can't believe it. We haven't gotten into an argument yet. Time has flown, but and I know. I look forward to the day. Okay, and it's <laughs> been a pleasure working with you. Um, I whooped you with the wet noodle how many times? Um, I don't know, maybe 10 or 20. I'd walk into your office and I'd say, oh, come on. Um, I know you're a specialist in many things, and microintrusions <laughs> is one of them. Could you please uh, uh, be on the show? And we will uh, talk about this more. Um, you have a lot more examples, but perhaps the audience wants to know a bit about microintrusions. Um, as some can recall, I think it was one or two weeks ago, African American men were arrested just for sitting in a Starbucks waiting for a friend. I'm right. sorry, I'm smiling, but it's kind of like laughter through tears. Right. You know, it's exactly. absurd. Exactly. Uh, about three years ago, we had um, um, Ahmed Mohammed. He literally was arrested and fingerprinted. He was a Muslim uh, because he um, had a science project where he had a clock. He made this beautiful clock, and the teacher thought it was some kind of bomb mm. and called the cops, and he was fingerprinted. Those are some examples of micro intrusions yes. that we'll talk about, okay? Yes. And you're more of a specialist. You'll give some other examples. How are micro-intrusions related to human rights? Let us recall, first of all, Article I of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which, as St. John Paul the Great, St. John Paul II, said should be lived in letter and in spirit. Mm -hmm. Article I says all humans are born free and equal in dignity and rights and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Mm. Now, Eleanor Roosevelt, the American that was the head honcho that drafted the document wanted it to have non-sexist language okay. so they didn't talk about he or she or didn't talk about sisterhood. In a weird kind of way, micro-intrusions are all over the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Maybe that will change eventually. Now, Article 2 of the Declaration says everyone is entitled to all the rights set forth in the Declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race. And I believe the first show we can concentrate on race, okay, if you want. Mm -hmm. But um, the second show we'll talk about some other things. Color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. Mm -hmm. um, and with, as other status, we could add age, um, disability, um, sexual orientation, family makeup. There are numerous examples here. Again, you'll be giving, giving us more. Um, if there is a disruptive child in school, there are all kinds of studies that say that if the um, teachers know, I'm not saying all teachers do this, but know that the child comes from a single parent family, they are more prone to refer the child to a psychologist or social worker mm -hmm. to deal with the disruptive behavior, even though it's similar Right. to a child that comes from a leave it to beaver kind of nuclear family, okay? Um, let me just um, have a quote from Eleanor Roosevelt, mm -hmm. who said, um, when asked, what are human rights and where do they begin? And she has this wonderful quote, and I think it's directly related 
to micro intrusions. Where do they begin, she said? In small places, close to home, so close and so small that they cannot be seen on any map of the world. Yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighborhood he lives in, the school or college he attends, the factory, farm or office where he works. Such are the places where every man, woman and child seeks equal justice, equal opportunity, equal dignity, without discrimination. Now, um, if my audience will bear with me just uh, one more minute, okay? Mm -hmm. And if you'll bear with me on being my typical professorial sure. self, my apologies. Micro intrusions are all over. It could be mail bashing. I'm at a street corner, and there's a woman in front of me. She just broke over with her girlfriend, and she knew I was there. She said, my boyfriend's a typical male macho idiot, and I'm right there. I'm frozen. I just don't know what to say. Or you have a woman, um, you know, a lot of our students are women, uh, not all, but mm -hmm. then they become social workers and they're, I don't know, working, they had 10 sessions with a child and they're finally making some progress. They, they work so hard that all of a sudden they're standing there with some men and they, someone yells at them, hey baby, and they sort of hurl this invective at them. It's kind of a total total lack of understand, I don't know if I'm making sense, but total lack of appreciation of, of who they are. And um, these are micro-intrusions. Uh, my feeling is we grew up with micro-intrusions. The ugly ducking is black, becomes a beautiful white swan. Um, uh, kids know about three blind mice. She cuts off their tail with a carving knife. Isn't that wonderful? So if a child is blind, or someone is blind, well, they're totally indispensable. We can just cut off their tails with a carving knife. The list is a long one, but enough of me. I want to have the insights of my colleague, Dr. Rhoda Smith. Uh, the floor is yours. I have um, three rather open-ended questions, and you could do whatever you want with them. You could um, have your own questions. How would you define what micro-intrusions are? Um, can you give us some examples? And then, of course, what could we do about micro-intrusions? Well, Go for it. Okay, that's a very, um, that was a very great intro and um, kind of broaching, setting the context for this conversation. Um, one part that I was struck by your introduction is, I think, around languaging. So where you started talking about um, if a child misbehaves and it is known that the child is from, you know, a, a family where there's been a divorce or some sort of loss or somehow that child's family doesn't fit into the typical box. Yes. Um, that that behavior is looked at in a way that is more um, problematic, um, that the behavior is more problematic than had the same identical behavior come from a child who was from a quote unquote intact family, right? So, um, typical we, nuclear, right? Leave it to so, be we talk time. about <clears throat> intact to refer to a home where there are two parents or a mother and a father, right? Um, and so the inverse becomes this child's from a broken home. Right. So if you are being labeled as a product of a broken home, then obviously there's gonna be some things about you as a child that are gonna be perceived as broken as well. Yeah. And so I think that languaging has a lot to do with some of the, the, the things that we, um, encounter in everyday life. So let me just start off by saying thank you for having me on the show. Very excited My to pleasure. be here. We've had some interesting conversations around these topics. Um, I do also want to say that, or just put it out here as a disclaimer, this is not my research area at all, but um, I've been in this body for a number of years, yeah. and so I'm pretty sure that I can speak from my own personal experience, as well as um, kind of integrate some of the literature around this. So I know that um, Deborah Wing Sue has 
um, written a number of books around microaggressions and um, cultural relationships and race relations. I think not only does it come down to the languaging of what happens to us, it also comes um, down to a matter of the meaning we hold behind behavior. So before okay. we even get into intent okay. and effect, um, you mentioned something else. You said a, a woman might be working in a capacity where she's helping to um, shore up or provide a foundation for get into um, a young child that and may have effect, um, um, you been mentioned something else. You said of some a sort, and she hears, "Hey, baby." Yeah. See, for me, my generation, or at least in my neighborhood where I grew up, hey, baby is not an insult. Hey, baby is almost a rite of passage. As a young girl, you're walking through a neighborhood oh, in an inner city, okay. right? And you're now being admired by the guys on the street. No one's going to approach you. No one's going to. They. It's, it's as much... For as as the muscle for them, they're exercising the muscle of how do I show my friends that I also am a purveyor of fine women or attractive women. So how do I do that in a public forum? Um, I've never I've never seen that as being um, derogatory in in, a, in any way because. I now have the option, anyone at any time can holler out anything. I have the option of responding, right? I have the option of I could respond or I could not respond. My husband also shares that his grandmother once told him it's not what they call you, it's what you answer to. So <laughs> by the same token, I've had racial epithets hurled at me out of car windows that were passing by as I walked down the street um, in Orange County, California. I'm not answering to that. You can yell it out all you want. So I think that there becomes a, a part of this where I can decide that I'm going to be offended uh -huh. or not by behavior, right? Uh -huh. And so part of that decision making is going to involve whether I decide your intent toward me was negative or positive, right? That there you had a are. that you had a positive intent or you had a negative intent. So I think you and I have entered into some conversations about what we are doing at the school with students, where we are trying to um, provide them with a master's level education to become a social worker. To me, this is, you know, it's an awesome profession. It's also one where we take responsibility for having difficult conversations. So I want to give you a chance to, um, you know, tell me what you think about what uh, I'm saying, because some of these become the difficult conversations that we're asking our students to engage in. Yeah, well, thank you. I guess you got me on that one. That's all I have to say. I don't really know. I never said I was a specialist <laughs> on other people's culture, right. but, but by talking about this, then, then we learn more about, mm -hmm. about other, other people's culture. Mm -hmm. so, um, so that's where I was, was coming from. A lot of women, you know, very educated, uh, working hard in their fields, mm -hmm. um, they're kind of like, uh, hey, you know, kind of referring them as, hey, baby, I right. guess in my culture might seem as kind of pejorative. But in other cultures, mm -hmm. it may not be seen that way. So, well, that was just one. Right. So, example. and I mean, where, what is the arena um, for where our young people um, get to practice their socialization, right? Um, a lot of times in our environment, people are practicing this coming of age socialization activity on a college campus. But everyone doesn't go to college. So where does that part of the population who doesn't go to college, where do they get to practice it? So I would think just drawing on, you know, this, the issue of um, behavior is repeated, that is reinforced, and behavior is extinguished, that is not. So if, you know, it's like small children, when they bite, you know, when small children are getting their teeth, being able to bite on something is actually a relief, which is 
high, where, where they have teething rings. But uh, small children don't distinguish between this is a te teething ring and this is not. So they might come up and bite you on the hand. Well, the good thing is when they bite you on the hand, you say, ow, ow, and they love that. So then they keep doing it because it's like I'm getting a reaction. Right. But if you, if you don't provide that positive reinforcement, they will discontinue that behavior. And so my point becomes if people are yelling, just using your example, hey, baby, and every time I turn around and I give them the, you know, the, what do they call it, the, 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 the hard stare, the stink eye, right? The kids yeah. today call it the stink eye, or I give them a piece of my mind, and that is seen as favorable among their peers, then they're going to continue to do that. If they yell out, hey, baby, and no response comes, eventually that behavior will die down. So I'm not saying that, you know, that is my preferred method of interacting with people I don't know on the street. But again, I look at the intent. So when I look at that behavior, for me, that behavioral intent is not to be negative. It's more for that person. They're exercising something about themselves. So Sounds that's good. so I think that, you know, when we start talking about when you mention micro intrusion, we really are talking about something that falls under a category of a microaggression. So there are micro insults where someone says um, something that can be construed as an insult. Sometimes it's meant as an insult and sometimes it's not. But um, so there, it's almost like language that has, or statement that has a double meaning. So that if you were to confront the person of, oh, when you said this to me, that was hurtful, that they could easily respond with, oh no, that's not what I was saying. What I was saying was, so sometimes this language has, you know, there's languaging that has a double meaning. A micro assault, um, so in my mind, and this was something that um, came to me as I was just kind of, you know, looking over some of the literature out there, a micro assault is actually not a true assault in terms of where we make physical contact with one another, but it's more of kind of an assault on, you know, a verbal assault on something that may have, hold value to you. Right. right. And then the third thing is um, a micro. So we talked about micro insult, micro assault, and then there's a micro invalidation. OK. And I think that these are just um, statements that kind of invalidate. So, for example, if I said, um, oh, yeah, I'm a social worker. Oh, yeah, those people, they, they take they take you know, people's kids away. So it's like, let me invalidate that pride that you have around your profession, right? Yes, exactly. So, and again, it doesn't necessarily mean that there is a harmful intent, but it could be seen as harmful. And then if you look at, and I think, you know, I know you mentioned that we're going to be kind of talking about race. So... You know, if you look well, there's at also disability, age, everything. Yeah, but there, we can there, are yeah. there are lots of isms. There's lots of isms, but it, I mean, again, if we're going to just talk about you know how these come up in terms of race, then you have the added um, task of taking what you heard and then trying to apply that to would this have been said to someone if they didn't look like me? Right. So it's it's always um, important, I think, to recognize that these microaggressions can occur around any marginalized group. So, you know, around gender, religion, um, age, um, ability. Right. But in terms of race, they seem to. Um, I don't know. I think it, it becomes like this death by a thousand cuts thing, where if you if you get so many of these little cuts, eventually it'll kill you, right? The cuts might not yeah, kill you, like but the infection might. The accumulated right? indignities that exactly. Martin Luther King talks about. Right. That's kind of a death knell. Exactly. So when you're talking about human rights, um, I think that um, 
when I when I think about this topic, something that comes up for me is that I think we just need to think now more carefully carefully about one another than we used to have to, right? Because there's an issue of being um, hurt by language and behaviors, right? There's the, the issue of, of that effect. And then there is, again, as I mentioned earlier, the intent. So, you know, when I was growing up, we had the sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Right. And what we are learning as we evolve as human beings is that names do hurt people and how people, you know, how people experience you that can be hurtful. And so um, I think then we have to, again, there's this loop where now we have to go back to what was the intent, right? Sometimes it's difficult to perceive intent. Sometimes someone has an ax to grind um, at a level that's above your head. Um, so for example, um, you know, I don't know if I said, you know, I, I, I had, you know, I came from California and so I said, oh, California, it's full of nuts and fruits or whatever. It might not be about me and the fact that I came from there, but it could be about California. But what they're saying now about California, if that's my native home, if that's some place I love, then the effect is that it could be, you know, perceived as hurtful to me. My husband actually is like this. He's a native Californian, so he's very sensitive around California. And so we might go somewhere and, you know, say we came from California, and the person will say, California? And we'll say, yeah, and, you know, they'll ask, you know, we'll have some pleasant conversation. Then we get in the car, and my husband said, did you hear how they said California? It's like, dude, they right. just said California. But my point is... More sensitive. He's more sensitive around that. That he, That is seen as his native home. And so, you know, so again, where we see these varying levels of effect. So there's a third, there's that third, you know, piece of the triangle. There's intent, there's effect, and then it's moderated by the level of sensitivity. Right? So I think, you know, we've seen, you know, you've seen some satirical uh, movies or comedians acts around um, race. And so I think to be able to laugh about it is great. But then it's like, where does it, you know, is there this continuum between crying and laughing? Like you were saying earlier, I have a smile on my face while I'm talking about something unpleasant, but yes. there's this inner kind of pain around right. things. So hopefully this is staying on track and answering some of your questions. It's definitely staying on track. <laughs> No, it's great. Yeah, no, I was talking about laughter through tears. Right, exactly. That exactly. is very sad what's happening, mm -hmm. but it, what can you do? You smile on it, but it touches your inner soul. Yes. And so I think what you and I, uh, you know, one of the things I know that we agree on is that we are trying to um, create a culture of social workers who don't get so caught up on the intent and the effect, but really become more open to, ah, here's an opportunity to have a conversation. Here's an opportunity for me to actually look underneath what was being said and what is the intent and what is the meaning. Because I think that until we can really begin to have an open dialogue about some of these issues, um, it's not going to change in terms of um, racial relations and society. I, mean, I was very impressed by, um, I know you had mentioned when we spoke earlier, about the Starbucks incident. There are so many things about the Starbucks incident that I was impressed by. So when I say Starbucks incident, you know, we're talking about the incident where two young men um, were arrested at a Starbucks African for being American at the, men, they're yes. African American men. They're at the Starbucks waiting for someone, and because they haven't ordered, someone calls the police. So um, when the police arrive, they arrest them. 
And then later, it's my understanding, the way the suit was settled is the young men settled for $1 each, and they asked that $200,000 be put into a program for young African-American men. Starbucks subsequently decided we're going to have a day that we close, and we're going to devote that day to training and retraining our staff about um, cultural awareness, so for lack of a better word. I, I could be, that might not be what they called it. Maybe they called it diversity training. So yeah, so to wrap it up, I just want to say that Starbucks did absolutely the right thing. The police, I'm very concerned about. Okay. So, so they need training also. Obviously. Yeah. I just have to say that there are all kinds of um, human rights training for law enforcement personnel that the United Nations has come out with, if, you, if any of the audience wants to Google that. Okay, so um, this was great. This was, was a good great. beginning. Yes. And uh, we'll continue for episode uh, number two for um, our viewers. Okay. And uh, we'll continue with our, what the United Nations refers to as a creative dialogue. Yes. Okay, to resolve some of these issues of micro intrusion. That would be great. Thank you very much. Thank and, you for having um, me. Take care, everyone. Take care of yourself and take care of others. All right. Bye now.